I'd like to thank the organizers for asking me to speak today on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics in colorectal surgery. So why are we talking about this today? Um, I think it's pretty clear that with the tech revolution, um, technology has infiltrated all aspects of our lives, and it's beginning to infiltrate uh, medicine and surgery. Uh, in the case of the robot, it basically represents better hardware than traditional laparoscopy with improved ergonomics, improved access to difficult uh, corners like the pelvis or in, in head and neck, for example, and generally improved technique with better angulation and better visualization. In the case of AI, uh, AI is simply better software than what we have now. It uh, has the promise of being more efficient, more accurate, and importantly, cheaper. So I thought we could start talking about AI, and I think at the beginning, at the outset, it's probably important to define some terms so that we're all on the same page. So the first term is, what is artificial intelligence? It's a pretty broad term. It just basically means intelligence that is not human or animal, so by machines. And that uh, could be anything from you know, an ECG tracing that gives you an arrhythmia, which is fairly simplistic, to very complicated machine learning and deep learning uh, type computers. So it's a, it just generally means uh, intelligent computers. With machine learning, um, this specifically refers to AI that's teachable and gets better with time. So the more data it has, the more intelligent it becomes. With deep learning, this replicates the human brain. So not, all, not only does it get more intelligent with time, it has the capacity to self-learn. So it doesn't need to be fed information. It can obtain its own information from its surroundings or the data that it has access to and improve its intelligence with that. Uh, and in order to achieve that, it uses something called artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are basically the computer analog of the human brain. So there are multiple synapses and connections between different neurons uh, in a virtual way that can be formed and unform uh, in an intelligent fashion. So most people understand AI as machine learning or deep learning these days, and that's mainly what I'll be talking about today. So over the last few years, uh, we've developed a collaboration with the Australian Institute for Machine Learning. Uh, we're pretty lucky in Adelaide in that um, the, so one of the national centers for machine learning is on our street next to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, and that facilitates uh, collaboration. Um, I have shamelessly borrowed a lot of these data and slides from uh, one of my research fellows, Sergei Bedrykovetsky, who, who serves as the go-between between my unit and the AIML building. And so he's been instrumental in uh, conducting some of these studies and facilitating collaboration. So this all started, I think my interest in actually publishing on AI started in 2017 when we uh, looked at a nomogram used to predict an astomotic leak. Um, at the time, I was a colorectal fellow at the Royal Adelaide, and I was trying to look at ways of predicting an estimotic leak that were a bit more reliable than just surgeon intuition. Um, and so we used the published nomogram and created a calculator, which is available at anastomoticleak.com for colon cancer resections. And that is fairly predictive of an estimotic leak. And I find it helpful in uh, counseling patients pre-op, but also in making decisions about who gets a join, who doesn't get a join, and who gets defunctioned. What was interesting about this 2017 paper, though, is that on top of the calculator, we used an AI model to see if we can improve its predictive value. And the AI model, without any sort of additional input, did manage to somewhat increase the area under the curve uh, and result in a, in a better calculator. Um, now, this was a fairly simplistic way of doing it, but I had access to um, a proprietary software by IBM called Watson Analytics. Um, so this is sort of cheating because we didn't build the AI model ourselves. I just plugged the data into this fancy computer and it spat out uh, a better model. Um, specifically, it incorporated age, which we thought was not predictive in estimotic leak. But when you look at uh, the data as a whole and you insert age into the pre-existing calculator, the AI model found it to be predictive and we since validated this. So this was sort of a cheap and nasty way of doing AI um, and was the first paper we ever published on uh, AI in surgery. So finished my fellowship, came back to the Royal Adelaide and became interested in pelvic exenteration. And as part of that, we joined the Pelvex Collaborative. Um, they have quite a large data set of pelvic exenterations. Uh, and so my second paper was a collaborative one with the Pelvex Collaboration. They did all the work for this, but we supplied some data. 
Um, the interest here was trying to predict outcomes of pelvic exenteration, which is notoriously difficult to do. Um, and so they had a fairly large data set and used 60% of this to train an AI model to try and predict outcomes. Uh, and then validated this on, a, on another 20% and tested it on the final 20%. And this is a more uh, robust uh, AI analysis where you actually create the model yourself using the data that you have. Um, and interestingly, the AI model was predictive of outcomes, particularly with regards to prolonged length of stay. So the model that was built could tell you if a patient was going to end up being in hospital for an extended period of time. And when you're doing pelvic exenteration or your pelvic exenteration center, that's really quite important because the administrators focus on day stay as one of the main parameters uh, with regards to funding. And so this uh, hopefully has promised to become useful in the future for, from that side of things. More recently, we've become interested in diagnosing uh, abnormal lymph nodes on imaging. Again, this is notoriously difficult and radiologists are typically not as accurate as we would like them to be. In the current era where we're giving more and more neadjuvant treatment, it becomes really useful to find out if somebody has positive lymph nodes before you resect the cancer, particularly in rectal cancer, but increasingly also in colon cancer. You know, uh, you know, for example, with MSI high cancers, if you would tell me as a colorectal surgeon that a patient has uh, abnormal nodes, we may consider giving them neoadjuvant immunotherapy rather than proceeding to surgery. But the linchpin of this whole thing is finding out if the lymph nodes are abnormal to begin with, which has been difficult in the past. It's also very time consuming to look through the scans, particularly for colon cancer, and look at all the draining lymph nodes. Um, and so this initial paper, Sergey, the pre re previous research fellow I showed you, did a meta-analysis of AI uh, to predict abnormal lymph nodes in abdominal pelvic malignancies. This is all abdominal cancer. Um, I'll go a bit more deeply into the AI models here. There's basically two types of AI models that can be used here. Uh, radiomics is where humans or clinicians tell the AI algorithm which features to extract, things like lymph node size, border irregularity, heterogeneity. So the, we, we sort of prime the model with information as to which features are relevant, and that can then learn about which nodes are positive and which are negative. A more advanced method, though, is deep learning, where the algorithm is agnostic to any human intervention. So we just tell the algorithm, this patient has a positive node, this patient is node negative, you figure it out and it goes through a complicated process of figuring it out on its own. This is more complex, but also more powerful because it's not biased by any sort of human preconceived notions as to what a positive node is and what a negative node is. And so it has the promise of being uh, more accurate uh, than, than the training radiologist, for example. So when we look at Sergey's meta-analysis results, um, they're pretty exciting in the sense that uh, radiomics, which was the older technology, which uh, as a result has a lot more papers in it, uh, shows that it's actually pretty predictive, particularly in urology, where you know the area under the rock curve approached 0.9. Um, but you know, even in uh, gynae, hepatobiliary, upper GI, and colorectal, it was fairly predictive. There was only one paper at the time of the meta-analysis that looked at deep learning as opposed to radiomics, and this was in rectal cancer, and this was fantastically predictive at 0.91, um, which would supersede what we would uh, understand from the radiologist, but also is much quicker. So, you know, it took the algorithm 20 seconds per case to identify whether this patient was node positive or negative. Whereas in this study, when you looked at the radiologist, it took about 10 minutes. As part of this meta-analysis, we also looked at the radiologist's accuracy because that was, that was often in the comparison group. And you can see that the area in the rock curves are significantly lower um, than that for AI. So this is a very promising paper and we're actively working uh, currently to try and um, further deep learning in terms of detection of positive. So this is where we've gotten so far. We've uh, collected data and built a database of 1,200 patients across two hospitals, the Royal Adelaide and St. Andrews Hospital. Uh, these patients have all had uh, their CT staging followed by surgery, and we've actually downloaded all their uh, relevant CT images, as well as their nodal status on pathology, whether they're positive or negative. And importantly, these patients, because they're spread out across the state, they've had images done by various different providers of radiology. And so therefore, it's not just one scanner in one hospital, which is like most other studies are. And this, I think, will improve the external validity of any findings.
So what we're doing at the moment uh, is uh, Sergey, as well as some um, uh, students assisting under my supervision, are segmenting or identifying individual nodes uh, uh, depending on where the tumor is. So for example, for a right colon cancer or cecal cancer, they segment out the individually the ileocolic and right colic nodes. Uh, this has been completed now for 500 patients. I mean, this is a huge task because it's done on every image. Um, and this is being used to train the AI algorithm to recognize who is node positive and node negative. And this will then be tested on a uh, validation followed by a testing set of the remaining new patients um, that we collect. And ultimately what we're looking for is something like this. This is obviously a mammogram. Uh, but you can see that uh, there's a widget in the bottom right corner and in real time while you're looking at this mammogram image using the radiology software the widget will tell you what they, the ai estimates the percentage chance is that this patient has a cancer and we're hoping for something similar while we're looking through our ct scans uh, for colon cancer at our mdt because i think having this uh, additional input would help improve the quality of the discussion at the MDT, particularly with regards who should get surgery and who should get knee adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's lymph nodes, which is currently our active area of intervention, but we are looking to the future at other problems we can solve. Um, sarcopenia is a pretty hot topic at the moment because it's very predictive of surgical and patient outcomes. Um, and so we are interested in is there a way to use AI to better understand and measure sarcopenia? The trouble with sarcopenia is that it's annoying to measure. So in order to, to, to pick up whether someone's sarcopenic or not, you've got to do a whole bunch of fancy calculations. It takes too long. And as a result, we don't really use it uh, in practice. So what if we could find a way to automatically give you the sarcopenia measurement um, on CT scan? That's actually much easier than lymph nodes because the psoas muscle is very easy to identify for the AI algorithm and the calculation is fairly simplistic for a computer. And so um, we are working on this topic now and hopefully we'll have some results in the next few years uh, for an automated sarcopenia measurement uh, in patients with colorectal cancer. We've been interested in total knee adjuvant therapy for rectal cancer. And in fact, we've been robustly pursuing this at the Royal Adelaide since 2019. Uh, basically all patients at the Royal Adelaide now that would previously have had long course uh, knee adjuvant treatment are now getting TNT. Um, and <clears throat> the complete response rate is much higher than it used to be. So, you know, just under half our patients now um, don't have surgery because they have a complete clinical response to TNT. Where we, uh, our current weaknesses really is predicting who are going to be the 50% that respond and who are not. And so we are wondering whether we could plug in a whole bunch of values into a computer uh, and that could tell us which patients should get TNT and which patients shouldn't. Um, I think we need a much larger data set for this. So we're still a way off from being able to achieve this. But one day I expect once we're up to say a thousand patients or more that we can use AI to better target who gets total knee adjuvant therapy as opposed to having a gunshot approach where everybody gets it uh, and we hope that 50% respond. So moving on to robotics now, um, you know, this, I see this as sort of a hardware version of what we're going through with AI. So it's the next iteration in hardware. Um, I'll go through some um, data um, and, and sort of an inkling of what might be coming in the future. So I won't go through this in too much detail, but it, suffice to say in colorectal cancer, there are some data on robotics, but the data show no benefit to patients. Uh, the biggest trial done on this, the ROLA trial in rectal cancer compared robotic with laparoscopic surgery. It was a multi-center RCT. The primary outcome was conversion to open, but they all looked at the usual markers that you want to look at. A fairly large study, and there was no difference in outcome, but the robot was about a thousand US dollars more expensive per patient. There were some limitations of this study. Um, many of the surgeons were still within their learning curve. Some centers did not think there was equipoise, so they just launched into robotics and were not happy to randomize the laparoscopy, particularly since laparoscopic TME for rectal cancer has never really proven itself as superior to open surgery. And so a lot of surgeons went from open surgery to meddling a bit in laparoscopy, but quickly moving on to robotics and have never looked back really. Um, so the comparison group was not ideal. And as we discussed, the primary outcome of conversion was not ideal. But despite these limitations, it was a pretty big study. It was multi-center and it showed no benefit.
and this remains probably the largest thing to date. There is one uh, large meta-analysis which includes a whole, which includes Roller and a whole bunch of smaller RCTs, and this shows no difference in patient outcome. It is expensive, so the machine costs three and a half million dollars at the moment. Um, there's a whole bunch of new machines coming online, which may be cheaper, um, and it's about 200 grand per year in maintenance. Um, so, you know, all of this adds up. So there is a cost to it. And as far as we can tell, there's no major patient benefit at the moment. In practice, however, um, I think it's fair to say that not many people, surgeons or patients, seem to care about the cost benefit analysis. Uh, there are no more RCTs planned. Uh, practice has not really changed. And robots continue to proliferate in every hospital and on every continent. And I think this is because it's an unstoppable process of innovation. And so, you know, there is no question that the robot is technically more advanced than laparoscopy. Um, there are a whole bunch of additional drivers, such as private practice pressures, business pressures, aggressive marketing by companies that make the robot. Um, but also, you know, th there's some non-cynical stuff, like maybe the future for robotics will be better. Um, the robots will continue to improve with every generation, and it's conceivable that we're just in the early phase now, and that in you know 50 years' time, there will be significant patient benefit and potentially cost saving from robotic surgery. As far as the future, um, I think robotics and AI are going to come together, and and basically what you're going to have is better robots and better AI. As far as better robots. There is a single port robot uh, out there. I'm not sure if that's going to add much to patient care, but it's there. Um, independent arms might reduce the cost because you could use only one or two or three arms, whatever you need for your operation. And I think flexible instruments will aid in access to difficult nooks and crannies like the pelvis. Um, better software, I think, is uh, going to be a major step forward. Um, AI to help the surgeon identify certain landmarks like ureters and other things would be very useful. Um, and then finally, you know, if you look much further into the future, it is possible that we will have some autonomous robots. So robots that do surgery independently of any surgeon. And I know that seems scary and very far-fetched, um, but you know, it's under consideration. So I'll leave you with a couple of videos. Um, this is a video showing an autonomous robot doing a small bowel anastomosis in a pig. Uh, it's important to note that this robot is not being controlled by a surgeon. It's being controlled by AI. And the surgeon here is merely assisting the robot uh, by following the sutures. And if you thought that was scary, um, this is a recent example from earlier this year of a robotic hand. Um, this is driven by, again, by uh, machine control, but it uses hydraulics to replicate the human hand. It's got the same amount of strength as a human hand and pretty much the same amount of dexterity. So I think if we are thinking that autonomous surgery is not along the way somewhere along the line, um, I think that would be pretty naive, um, but hopefully it's a long way off and after I'm long gone and retired. So thank you very much for that. I hope the talk's been useful and I look forward to answering any questions. Cheers.